Kelly? Hello and welcome everyone to day two of 20 days of Inspirethon, Asia's first and largest virtual festival of transformation for business teams to thrive in 2022 and beyond. A project of Go Global Business School with LAMC Productions. A truly proud Singapore innovative. This time to reboot your business session is moderated by the beautiful Dr. Aziza Jalandi and Mr. Viswa Sadisvan. Dr. Aziza has been in research and development for more than 19 years, specialising in the field of first of its kind conscious leadership, five intelligence framework, pioneering the people development industry from Asia, she has travelled extensively, connecting with the who's who of the industry, a strong believer of unity in diversity. This Singapore-born global business leader is Chinese educated, Tamil spoken and fluently communication with Malay too. Through her Go Global Business School, founded with business partner, Mr. Yapadas, she has consequently produced and conducted thousands of hours of online and offline transformational programs. Together with her Global Mentor Network, this has impacted thousands of business leaders and professional trainers, coaches, educators globally, expanding their possibilities in mind and heart to experience exponential growth and success. Most of all, continuing to support them in evolving to a higher level of consciousness. Dr. Aziza is passionate, practitioner and advocate for conscious leadership alignment and conscious capitalism focusing in national development, regional development, and global prosperity. Mr. Viswa Sadisvan is former nominated member of parliament in Singapore, as well as founder and CEO of Strategic Moves, a, a specific corporate strategy and communication consulting practice with more than 35 years of media experience. Viswa has interviewed top leaders including Singapore's first Prime Minister, the late Lee Han Yon, the first Prime Minister of Malaysia, the late Tong Ku Abdul Rahman, Longest-serving Premier, Toon, Dr. Mahatri and former US Prime Minister Barack Obama. Please make welcome Dr. Aziza and Mr. Viswa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you for joining us today. This is really really a very very important time in our life where we have come together this is the first time in the history of i know there's a bit of lag can you hear me yeah that's i think there's a yeah I'm, I'm asking about the uh internet here in linkedin so anyway so thank you so much for everyone tuning in and we are excited to be part of this wonderful journey together in this session today it's going to be a very meaningful one we have come together with an amazing panel of speakers that have showed up to guide us forward in this conversation what are we doing right now we are in the space of putting together what we call the next level of growth for small, medium enterprises, businesses, SMEs in Asia and across the world. So with that in mind, uh, in the last uh, couple of months, we have been brainstorming and thanks to Mr. Wiswa for his guidance. And it's in this event with, uh, in this event with I IQI, we have very, very excitedly come into the space of wanting to hear from business owners in Singapore, as well as 
with the support of ESG, I'm going to introduce the panel in a bit, uh, with, headed by Mr. Jeffrey Stiao. We are going to speak into what are the challenges currently faced by businesses in Singapore and, you know, what can be possibly the opportunities from here moving forward and how can we seek uh, the community support as well as the government support to move the businesses forward. So with that, I, what I would like to introduce the panel for today. We are very, very excited and grateful for the esteemed panel headed by the key panelists, Mr. Jeffrey Xiao, who is uh, who was uh, the nominee, appointed Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer of Enterprise Singapore on 27th of September 2021. The Enterprise Singapore is the government agency championing enterprise development. The agency works at, with committed companies to build cap capabilities, innovate and inter uh, internationalize. It is also supporting uh, the growth of Singapore as a hub for global trading and startups and build trust in Singapore's products and services through quality and standards. So th this is where we are very excited to have Mr. Jeffrey, who is also a graduate from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and also a uh, Sleon uh, Fellows program with an MBA. He also holds a BA in economics and government and a BSc in urban and regional studies from Cornwell. Cornell University universities and also in the panel with us today we have four very very experienced business leaders in the space we're very ha happy to introduce to you Ms. Loretta Alabon as the founder of LAMC Productions and LAMC Comedy Live uh, Ms. Loretta as many of you know is a celebrity legendary um, human uh, being in I mean a very very specialized legendary leader in the space of entertainment. She has 20 years of experience as a leading concert provider in Asia with a multi-million dollar business. Over the years, LAMC production has maintained a reputation in the global scene, having produced hundreds of biggest concerts and comedy tours in Singapore and Asia, working with a high caliber international and local agents of entertainment companies, has a thoroughly uh, trained them to deliver top-notch services to clients and audiences globally. To date, LAMC has produced, as I said, hundreds of successful shows in Singapore and across Asia. And some of the top world artists are Guns N' Roses, Lady Gaga, Justin Bieber, Panic at the Concert, Foster the People, and many, many such great artists. And together with us, we also have Mr. Peter Ho, who is one of the directors of Hope Technique Private Limited, a company he founded in 2006. Hope Technique is an engineering solution provider specializing in niche areas of high-tech engineering with departments in unmanned systems, defense, biomedical, smart technologies, and special vehicle arenas. arenas. Mr. Peter serves as CEO where he guides the company towards long-term technical business goals and has seen the company grow from startup in 2006 through to a multi-million dollar group at present employing 60 teammates. And we also we have in the panel today a successful entrepreneur by the age of 20, Mr. G. Shanmugam is very, very well known in the local FNB scene, especially among the Indian uh, restaurateurs. He set up his Singapore's first Indian pub in 1992 and his first restaurant, Gayatri, as the founder and chairman and CEO of Gayatri Restaurant Group. He is also uh, has taken the role of the president of Singapore Indian Re Restaurant Association from 2024 to 2020, 2011. He's an avid organizer of fundraising and food sponsorship events, and he has been uh, seen to support definitely a lot of various community and welfare organization. It is mentionable that he was one of the pioneers in putting together the central kitchen concept for Singapore uh, Indian restaurants in early, as early as 2012. And we have with us in the panel one more panelist who is with immense experience in the multinational, 20 years actually, in the multinational management space, Ms. Candice Cheng who has pioneered in setting up and leading central center of excellence for multi-billion dollar business in Asia. 
she has also been training for customer service for luxury brands and providing uh, support from Singapore as well as global market. It's a global brands that she has represented. Right now, she's also collaborated with Go Global as a Chief Transformation Officer, focusing on supporting trainers, coaches, and mentors in the industry to globalize themselves. With that, I would like to once again welcome every one of you and bring the stage to Mr. Wiswa, our co-moderator and the Chief Editor of IQI. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Aziza. Uh, can you hear me? I, I hope yes. I'm not muted or anything. Good. Uh, the topic, let's get down to the topic. The topic is 2022. We're looking towards next year. Uh, is it time to reboot business? Is it time to reboot business? Right? So we are obviously here to talk about the challenges we faced. You know, we are here to talk about the opportunities that may have actually arisen as a result of the crisis. And, and, uh, and that's the reason why we have selected entrepreneurs from very different backgrounds in very different sectors so that it'll be more or less representative. A little bit of background about the situation, right? COVID-19 pandemic, well, we all know it's been a great shock to the global, global economy. Uh, as a small, open uh, economy, Singapore was particularly affected, right? And uh, there were multiple budgets amounting to $100 billion uh, contributed by the government uh, over a span of nine months to stabilize the COVID-19 situation with, uh, within, within Singapore itself, right? The economic impact has been, you could say, uneven. It, it varied from sector to sector. Uh, the worst hit sectors were the aviation sector, tourism, food and beverage, or F&B, and retail. These were, the, these were the sectors that were very badly hit. Lower income groups are also disproportionately affected. Workers in high touch redundancy, uh, sorry, high touch industries and, and jobs requiring face to face interaction. Uh, these workers were particularly affected as well, you know, because of redundancies as a result of social distancing measures brought uh, that, that, that had to be enforced. Now, small and medium enterprises or SMEs are the backbone of Singapore's economic landscape, as we all know. You know, uh, SMEs contribute to nearly half of Singapore's GDP and employ about 70% of Singapore's workforce. COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic brought about unprecedented business cha challenges for SMEs. For example, nine in 10 saw their business operations impacted, nine in 10, right? Three in five reported a decline in revenues directly affected by COVID. Now, uh, it's important to mention this, the, the emerging stronger task force set up by the government, uh, uh, which envisions businesses in Singapore tapping new growth areas by activities such as digitalization of supply chains, growing smart commerce through online uh, to offline partnerships, increasing productivity through robotics, and finding solutions to meet sustainable goods. All of these things have also helped very much uh, for us to look beyond our own horizons to find solutions. <clears throat> so that's why we are here today. And that's why the topic carefully chosen. We don't want to drive looking at the rearview mirror. We want to drive into 2022 looking at the windscreen and occasionally glancing at the rearview mirror to learn some lessons. So we'd like to hear, actively listen to our entrepreneurs today to find out what have been some of the key challenges, not just from your own experiences, entrepreneurs, uh, but also what you have learned from your friends. What kind, of, what kind of challenges have your friends faced, right? Uh, how have we all found ways to overcome these challenges? And how have we also grasped opportunities, seized the moment, so to speak? Many of you have already done that. Share your experiences. Now, it's just as important to hear from the government what their perspective, what the government's perspective has been. How successful do you think the government feels that they've, they have helped the situation? 
what sort of handouts, what sort of support has been av uh, available, and what's in store for the future, right? Uh, these are some of the things we hope to hear, and 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 uh, I'm sure we are also eagerly waiting to hear from Jeffrey uh, Jeffrey Xiao, uh, who's GM and CEO of Enterprise SG. Not so much to put you in a spot, Jeffrey. Uh, that's not the intention, but to to hear from you what might be some of the plans for the following year and the years to come. You know how we can work together. I I don't think we really are looking at the entrepreneurs here. I don't think we are really looking for handouts. Because handouts actually are not what true entrepreneurs look for. We look for support. We look at globalization. We look at how you can give us, how you can open doors for us, you know. And and uh, Enterprise SG, which is a merger of two very separate stat boards, right? I.e. Singapore that looked at externalization of Singapore enterprises, that looked at trade very much, uh, merged with Spring Singapore, which is the stat board, which was the stat board that looked after SMEs, you know, and SMEs in Singapore are defined as uh, anything with a turnover of about 100 million and below, right? So that's the broad definition. So, so we we have a lot, a lot to discuss today, uh, within the next hour or so. And what is important for us is, if I may urge, let's listen carefully to each other. Let's use this opportunity to listen carefully to each other. As we express our concerns, let's not also point fingers, I hope, right? Because we are all in it together, including government. So with that, I'd like to invite, um, perhaps we'll start with Jeffrey. Jeffrey, three minutes, you know, uh, very quick, your own take about what's the role of government? Are you happy with what we have achieved so far as an economy, as a society? Uh, and what can we look forward to? Over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Vishwas, and good afternoon, everybody. Very happy to kick off this panel discussion for everyone. I, as I'm the only non-business representative, I thought it would be useful for me to set some context to outline what the government has done to support businesses through COVID-19 in the last two years. And then what I would do is just to share some thoughts on what we expect going forward as we hopefully transit into a better situation with the pandemic. Well, as uh, Vishwa said, COVID-19 has had a severe impact on businesses, not just in Singapore, but worldwide. In Singapore, the government has provided unprecedented support. We drew almost $100 billion from our government reserves to help businesses, first of all, deal with the initial shock. So the money went to things like working capital loans and bridging loans, which provided credit access for companies and rental relief to help ease the cash flows uh, in a difficult situation. The money also went to the job support scheme, which I think was especially important to help companies preserve capabilities and to retain employees. Government support is also given businesses a platform to adapt and transform themselves. This pandemic has accelerated the impetus for companies to digitalize, to improve productivity and to innovate. And there are many examples of companies, including those on our panel today, like LAMC and Gayatri, who have successfully pivoted in this new economy. Many others, of course, have taken advantage of enhanced government schemes like the Productivity Solutions Grant to build new capabilities. COVID-19 is not quite over, unfortunately. Now we are dealing with the Omicron variant, and there may yet be new variants or exogenous economic shocks like rising energy prices. But I think our businesses are better prepared, better resourced, and more experienced to cope with surprises. And we should go into this new year with some confidence. As we turn into this new phase of endemic COVID-19, I think the focus now is less on survival, but adapting to permanent changes in the economy and in society. How then should we adapt? I have uh, three broad areas to suggest three broad areas of partnership between government and business. But I'm looking forward to hear new ideas from the panelists today. Um, first, uh, we think we should continue to focus on innovation and to move up the value chain. We need more globally competitive businesses like Hope Technique, which have carved out a niche in high-tech engineering and manufacturing and are competing not just in Singapore, but competing against the world. Second, we should reinvest in reskilling the workforce 
identify how jobs and skills are evolving and support our workers, particularly the more mature ones, to develop new skills and to change careers if needed. And third, we should anticipate new trends to stay ahead. For example, the green economy. Consumers today have become more discerning on ESG, not enterprise Singapore, but environmental, social and governance issues. And we need to prioritize this, not just for consumers, but also to recruit young talent. This is not an exhaustive list, but I uh, look forward to discussing more ideas with the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> so basically, it's about um, uh, you know looking forward to adapting to permanent changes to the business environment. Right? I think that's very, very important because there have been some significant changes. Things are not going to go back to pre-COVID levels in many, many areas. And I think we, we might as well bite the bullet and accept accept it and see the see the opportunities that may arise because of this adversity right so we leave it Absolutely. there for now uh let's 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 hear from our entrepreneurs um loretta why don't we start with you thank you viswa um thank you dr aziza and go global this has been a very um uh, a, a wonderful uh, platform for me to share you know my troubles and you know the difficulties we've gone through uh, just to set the pace, um, we built the following brands uh, for 20 years. LAMC Productions is the music arm. Um, you know, as Dr. Aziza said, we've brought in you know a lot of the A-list acts. Um, acts have sold in excess of 100 million and streamed a billion songs um, from your Guns N' Roses, your Dion Warwick, legacy uh, acts like uh, Inglebert Humperdinck, etc. And then in 2011, uh, I discovered um, a new area to launch, which was comedy. At that time, uh, no one was bringing the, the big name comedians to Asia. But comedy as a platform, as an entertainment, has been going on, you know, in the 1930s and the 1940s with, you know, uh, Charlie Chaplin, you know, um, I Love Lucy and all these famous uh, TV shows. Um, so in uh, 2013, uh, we set up LA Comedy Live. Uh, this was basically a touring uh, a company, bringing all the A-list comedians into Singapore first, and then we expanded to other regions in Asia. Some of the big names we've promoted that people thought I was crazy putting Russell Peters in a stadium, uh, but I did it and I sold 18,000 tickets for him in 2012. And then we continued and repeat, we repeated the success with him year after year, and we formulated the Back by Popular Demand Tours uh, with Russell. So during the time from 2012 to 2016, we sold 60,000 tickets for Russell uh, in Singapore, Hong Kong, Singapore and Hong Kong and Indonesia. After that, um, I started promoting, identifying, you know, various comedians to bring out um, to Singapore, and these are British comedians, um, Indian comedians, and even uh, not discriminating, not discriminating the LGBTQ community. And uh, of course, I have to give you know a lot of um, thanks, thank you to the IMDA. You know, they allowed me to bring these cutting edge acts into Singapore. Um, all the queens from Blue Project Race. Um, what was shocking was when COVID happened, our business stopped. And 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 for the record, uh, um, Mr. Jeffrey, we did the last concert in Asia. So LAMC Productions did the last concert in Asia, which was Scorpions and White Snake. By that time, uh, you know, we already knew uh, this was becoming a very big issue because the shows we were doing were supposed to be cancelled. Um, but, you know, luckily the bands, um, we all kind of regrouped and we said, let's push forward and, and let's do the show. So March 5th was basically the last um, concert in Asia that we, we did the last concert in Asia. Uh, and we want to actually do a documentary on this, of our experience doing the last show in Asia. We don't know when we'll ever get back to 5,000 capacity or 8,000 capacity or 10,000. So um, as, as Mr. Vizra also pointed out, we are prepared not to go back to the same way of doing business. And 
we're here to basically evolve. And we've seen a lot of great opportunity because now from a B2C model, which we were selling tickets to in-person people in specific cities, we now can reach a global audience. And this is where, you know, later on, you know, I will, you know, want to reach out to uh, you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey, to find out what are the initiatives my company can, um, you know, uh, look at as we take on the global challenge with the live streaming, the amazing uh, NFT space, which I'm glad that, you know, we stuck on and we, we managed to stay on because my business now is worth a lot more than it was in 2019. So, yes, thank you. Wonderful. So, Loretta, uh, thanks for giving the background and, uh, and for being very direct about what the challenge is. And very quickly talking about the opportunity that arose and how you grasped it. And that you see, you see a lot more uh, opportunity ahead. Um, I like what you said about reaching out to a global audience um, and, and uh, live streaming. Uh, I, I think all of us can relate to it, right? I mean, everyone today knows what Zoom is. I mean, Zoom is euphemism for this platform. Of course, there are many other platforms, but, but who knew about Zoom? Who knew that even Zoom existed before that? Today, it's, it's, it's everyday word like Colgate, you know? So... So I, I think the world has revolutionized. People are not going to travel as much as before. You know, business travel is going to go down. Uh, I, I speak to I speak to large businesses, my clients. They tell me that it's going to be about fifty percent or less, and that that results in savings. Of course, it's going to hit the the airline industry, but at the end of the day, I think everyone needs to needs to rechart our journeys. You know. So, so this is an interesting point, right? That that you are saying that that your business is actually going to be much larger. The potential Absolutely. of your business, you know. Absolutely. So let's talk about it later a lot more about what can be done and what government, how government can can collaborate. Let's brainstorm and say how government can collaborate to make make companies such as yours, you know. Um, promising large enterprises that will actually go out to the world. You know, let's talk about that later. In the meantime, let's uh, let's maybe hear from Peter. Comple very different industry, engineering, Peter. Hi, everyone. Um, so I guess COVID was a surprise to everyone. We all hope and pray that it's the worst disaster that we have to live through in our lives. Let's fingers crossed. Um, if I were to give an analogy, right, it's like a Formula One race. So, you know, um, life and industry and business um, economies have run their course uh, through, the, through, through decades, uh, per se. And, you know, there are leaders and there are laggards, what have you not. But the way I see it is um, what COVID did was almost very similar to when a safety car comes out in Formula One, you know. It slows down the pack, everyone starts clustering together. In fact, there was, I, I would say, actually, the world stopped moving for a while. And, and this is something we've never seen. But if I were to flip it and continue on the, the conversation that you start, uh, you mentioned as well, um, it is where do we go from here? To me, it's, I think we need to be very cognizant that it's an unusual situation that everyone is starting almost from a standstill. Um, now, certainly the, the precedence of being um, an, in, a, in a position of advantage, right, uh, being leaders um, per se, um, has actually been taken from a lot of companies, a lot of economies. Uh, balance sheets are down, order books are, you know, there's a gap of a year and a half of orders and, and meetings. I think right now the biggest challenge is everybody in every country is going to try and run and accelerate as fast as they can. Um, personally, I've never seen such a busy Christmas season before. I mean, here we are on the eve of Christmas Eve having a session when typically I, I think most of us will be probably watching one of the concerts that she chose, right? Um, and enjoying ourselves, but, or, or eating at the restaurants, right? But um, this is exactly, you know, that, that kind of um, madness that I think we need to face. I guess my point, uh, my sharing today is really a case where um, as Singapore companies um, with the government, uh, public-private partnership uh, to accelerate out of a standstill is needed more so than ever before. And my perspective is, um, I hate to say this, but I think the worst is, is not over. 
um, you know, if we think that we it's business as usual, BAU and and you know all the meetings are coming back, all the concerts are coming back, uh, the business is going to be as per normal. It's going to flow through Singapore. I would challenge that simply because um, a lot of um, foreign entities have all gone home. Um, now it's a choice of whether they want to come back to Singapore. So my my worry really is um, come first of January, um, twenty twenty two is going to be a very tricky year. Um, we do need to work together and be very cognizant that if there was ever a time when, you know, you're running out of the block, right? Um, your elbows are, are, are dangling out. You've got to push each other and try and fly out of the blocks, right? Uh, this is exactly what we're going to face in 22. So uh, good luck to us all. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Peter. And um, I, I like what you said about every, um, and I quote, I hope I quote, I'm quoting you correctly. Everyone is standing, uh, is starting almost from a standstill. Um, you know that, that's very very important because <clears throat> it goes back to goes back to to business logic. It is very important for us to take stock at very important milestones in the journey of a company, right? Those of us who run companies, we know you can't just keep sprinting. You every now and then you got to stop or at least pause and then recheck and ask yourself very important questions or existential questions is this are you happy is this what you are doing is, is this what you want to do you know and and that that leads to this whole question of public private partnership you know and and if i may add <clears throat> to that to that you know government itself probably has to rethink government's role in helping enterprises you know, for, for the longest time, enterprises, especially SMEs, have been looking to government for handouts. You know, and that has been the relationship, you know, grants and so on. And of course, you need band-aids during a, a, during a difficult time. But I, I'm hoping that this, this actually alters the, the, the PPP <clears throat> sort of part, relationship. Government should actually be more of a partner than... Um, than uh, than Santa Claus, if I can put it bluntly, a partner, a partner who comes with us, helps to underwrite, helps to underwrite the risk, goes overseas together with us and pitches together with us. Maybe Tomasek Link companies can play a more important role in actually working with SMEs instead of competing with SMEs. I don't understand why the Masik Link companies are competing with SMEs on a broader front. They should be leading enterprises in Singapore outside, you know. So maybe we can talk openly and honestly about some of these things. This doesn't mean that we are being critical of government. I don't think that's the point. But I think we should just lay the cards on the table so that we can have an honest conversation. Right? Thank you. Um, Candice, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Viswan. So, I speak from my personal experience, all right? Working more than 25 years in MNCs, my most successful experience has been to set up a center of excellence for a multi billion dollar business for Asia, working from Singapore and Hong Kong. Now, since 2017, just to give a bit of a background, I've set up my own business helping companies in many areas of soft skills training, like communication, team synergy, memorable client experience. But from last year onwards, resilience and self is very, very important. The last two years have been really challenging to many businesses. So the external factors have really hit us at the point, right? Health, family, self-care, self-worth, and even questioning a life purpose. I realized that aside from all the soft skills training that we do, real need is helping businesses and their teams navigate through uncertainties. So both, and I'm talking about both organization and their teams. Because you know, uh, as an employee, you, you, as a company, you are no longer just looking at the employee as a professional, just in terms of contribution or performance. 
you have to take note of right? how they are doing right now. So the whole the whole um, model has changed really. So both organization and the teams need to be yes. resilient. Candice, how, how, if I may ask you, hmm. how has the model changed for for your your sector? Because yes. yours is a very people driven sector, right? Yes. You're dealing with and 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 I sense you're talking about <clears throat> emotions. Uh, uh, you use the word self worth. Hmm. You know, and and so all those things are important. But how yes. do you think the model has changed? Right. So what I can share is that you see in the past or traditionally, all right, uh, people work in the company, they try to strike a work-life balance. That means they're dividing professional life, personal life. So the personal life is kept out of it. So what happened during these two years is that it has merged. Unfortunately, personal life has merged with professional life. First of all, we work from home, but that's not really the issue. The thing is that people are becoming more fragile because I said they are hit at the core. And that explains the great vaccination, right? Because why is it that when people start to question their self-worth, what's the meaning in life, or oh, then they feel like resigning, why? First day or first few years when they reported to work, they were so full of excitement and all that. Why are they leaving? So companies need to, I say, change the model because companies no longer should just focus on, okay, what are the soft skills training uh, based on uh, business needs, people development needs, but they should really look at the softer part, how to help their internal teams navigate out of this. The, the leadership model is going to change. It's not just, uh, it's not just like, you know, saying, oh, we all have to be vulnerable, but People only choose to be vulnerable and share or expose certain parts. What exactly is embracing vulnerability? You know, so companies have to act in a different way. They now have to think about the emotions of their staff. So that's really one part. And I can really go deeper in this. It's, you know, it's, I really feel strongly about this. Now, then I just want to maybe at this point switch to the problems that many SMEs are facing also because we are alone in this battle and we need to build resilience and have more clarity in our business models. We need to, and again, back to why we go into business in order to think out of the box and thinking of alternative ways. Like Mr. Xiao said, I really resonate with that. We will not target for survival mode because I want to emphasize on creation mode. <coughs> I want to come out of it having new ways to create something totally different. And this is so glaring, right? Especially when I uh, joined the management team as Chief Transformation Officer with Go Global Business School. I realized the power of collaboration and collaborative marketing among cleaners, coaches, and business consultants. So I talk about my own area. So instead of seeing ourselves as single entities, kind of like competing with each other, why can't we come together as a community through collaborative marketing? I mean, right now, I know only Go Global. And as part of this strong global community, we can impact on more local businesses as a team, working on resilience, making them stronger, and eligible for funding, be it from the government or from other funds. Why the first suddenly can I think oh, so maybe uh, I yeah I, I, I yeah I look forward to sharing more later. Thank you, thank you, Candice. Uh, I I really enjoyed that that love that lovely that loving inter interruption from Shanmugam. <laughs> Shan, I'm talking to you. Are you there? <laughs> okay, um, I really like what you shared. I, no, no worries. I was just joking. Uh, Candice, you, 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 you very, you brought up some really very fundamental issues. You know, uh, people are going through stress. People are, 
people are aren't able to draw a clear line between work and home and that is very disruptive and stressful because we don't even know when work starts and when when home starts you know it's 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 stressful and and this is is this is not a short term this is going to be there forever you know that, that's what i guess you what you meant by business model change but i like the point you made about the need for us to look at leadership not just management but to look at leadership and values and care and all of those things are very important incidentally a few days ago i was talking to a business leader very prominent business leader you know and 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 she was sharing with me i mean she she runs a multinational company and she was sharing with me that exact point that she has she has had to spend 70% of her time 70 70% of her time not on bottom line considerations but on ensuring that people are feeling safe interacting with people asking about people's home situation and all of those things 70% of her time is spent on that not the bottom line because if you would just focus on the bottom line and ignore this is going to come back to bite you in a big way you know so your point is well taken and and maybe later on we can talk about what needs to be done what can be done about that i also like your point about collaboration you know uh, i i think this has been echoed in various conversations as well you know this is an opportunity for us to reframe competition to collaboration you know if we keep competing like we used to then it's going to be a red ocean all of us are going to be bleeding but if we start looking at areas that we can collaborate not just between government and enterprises but within among enterprises across clusters i think this can be a very very productive world and constructive world i i feel so so i really hope that we can talk a little bit more about that instead of bleeding let's find the blue ocean together right uh, that brings me quite comfortably to uh, to shanmugam who has been waiting to talk shan over to you good afternoon viswa thanks for the invitation thank you uh, i really appreciate uh, peter's view on the f1 uh, the last f1 we saw lewis hamilton and westerpen fighting for uh, the place and when lewis hamilton wasn't you know uh, ready for the last lap and was complacent and he lost the race and uh, this is what all about the current situation uh, that we are facing how fast we can run next year or even after next year right uh, what happened was like what this was said it's all finished and uh, those who are still going strong they have to look at different angles to come up with different ideas and and to sell your products uh, in a different manner like our food you know uh, we are now going on uh, uh, door deliveries you know uh, di digitalization and all those things so these are important now and what we have done past was like you know we are waiting for clients to come per day 600 to 1000 Uh, patrons will come in and go so these are all history and uh, we are now beginning to see some different things happening in the restaurant industry uh, lucky about 6 7 years ago when i met uh, viswa we were talking about aut automating our entire kitchen and we did this is where last year we really made it because uh, of course the government gave us some contracts Uh, for for uh, during the circuit breaker about six months to do deliveries to uh, the foreign workers and all those things and that kept us alive uh, in a big way and uh, we are still alive we are still doing good but what is happening now with my uh, all my uh, young children and all that they are they are working very hard to go further and uh, things are going to change we are we are not following what we were doing. Uh, last few years so door deliveries uh, uh, we are doing about 20000 meals today 
to workers and in, uh, institution caterings like uh, Shell and other 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 brand names, popular brand names. So we are afloat now. Uh, one one of my advice to all F and B owners that you there are different kind of uh, uh, food uh, business in Singapore, right? We have some restaurant who catered only for uh, tourists, and if you are doing that, try to change yourself, right? You have to do a different way for the locals, door deliveries, you know, institution. So this is how you have to change. We change about eight years ago. You know, we do institution catering. We change. We don't want to just depend on uh, uh, restaurant, uh, retail res restaurant business. You know, so we have changed, and by changing, uh, we have done well during the pandemic. And now, currently, we are moving on. You always treat like an endemic. Of course, uh, you must be careful, like the government has, uh, like a tap. Uh, they will close it when they want, and they open it when they think that it is good. And we had a lot of uh, assistance from uh, the government to change our policy regularly uh, to automize my kitchen and my businesses. And I'm very happy that during the pandemic, the government came back and helped us. And hopefully, like what Ms. Wah said, moving forward, they will continue doing that so that we can have a leeway to, to, to change our businesses accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Shanmugam. And if, yes. if I could, if I could share uh, my personal experience with Shanmugam, um, I happened to be on the Spring Singapore board at that time when uh, when we were talking about this, and uh, and Shanmugam had asked me to have a meeting together with him with uh, several members of the Indian Restaurant Owners Right Association, and we talked. Uh, and I was trying to encourage them, and, and I think there was an MOM representative there as well, trying to encourage that, you know, if you do your part, God will help you. God, of course, in this case was government, right? <laughs> and, and, and that was it. That, that was the message I was giving them. We have a government that is willing to meet you halfway if you are prepared to get out and get out of self-pity and bite the bullet and accept that the government is not, is not going to unfreeze the quota on foreign workers. You, you see what I'm saying? And so, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Shanmugam. This is why we still pray to the same God. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but but, but, but it, is, it is interesting because Shanmugam and a couple of others got together and they said, okay, we will demonstrate the willingness to get out of comfort zone. And uh, at that time, a lot, for a lot of them, Central Kitchen was a taboo because each one said, my recipe is very special, right? Mm -hmm. and, and because a few of them actually stepped forward and said, we will, we will go with the Central Kitchen idea, Spring Singapore actually funded us quite significantly, you know. So, so this is a classic example. And my point here is actually... You do need a COVID to wake us up every now and then. I think, I think it doesn't have to come in the form of COVID. But, you know, sometime back, it was frozen quotas on foreign workers. It forces people to say, it's not the, it's not the old normal. We've got to start looking at things differently. So every now and then, when this thing happens, the real entrepreneurs will step out of comfort zone and create new dimensions. Yes. So here's here's my question for you, uh, Jeff. Right. Uh, based on whatever we have heard so far, my question to you is this: just to kick off the discussion. You know, government government always has a dilemma between trying to help everyone equitably, and at the same time, the need to pick champions. See, you need trailblazers. You need to pay attention to the prime mover as you pay attention to the goods, the goods cabins. But if you don't pay attention to the prime movers, the guys who are prepared to fight battles, to lead battles, to find new battles to fight and risk it all, then you're not, you're not going to go far. But I sense that the government is maybe a little bit overly concerned about 
being equitable to everyone. And I put it to you, when you try and be equitable, you actually end up not being fair. It's like communism. What's your response? Thanks, Vishwash. Uh, I wanted to, first of all, just uh, respond quickly to Candice to let her know that she's not alone in this battle. I mean, entrepreneurship is a long and not so easy journey. But uh, if you've heard all the stories around, you know, in this, just in this panel today, I mean, you have very encouraging and inspiring stories. You've heard Loretta's story. You've heard Sean's story. Whether it's reaching out to global audiences, whether it's setting up cloud kitchens and automating and growing your company a lot more. These are wonderful stories. I mean, these were companies that, as Vishwa said, you know, they were companies that did well before the pandemic. They were companies that did well during the pandemic. They changed before the pandemic. They changed during the pandemic. This is what happens, right? When the world changes, the, the talent rises and the, the cream rises to the top and you take advantage of opportunities and you fight through. Yeah, I mean, Vishwas, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, there is a whole range of companies that government is responsible for. Over the last two years, it's been an absolute priority for us to focus on survival, keeping companies, businesses alive, because the shock was just unprecedented. But as you know, you know, uh, Enterprise Singapore was set up indeed to focus on this mission of helping Singapore companies grow, internationalize, do well. It doesn't mean that we, it's a, a either or arrangement. Um, think of Enterprise Singapore. I, I use this metaphor like a, of a bank. You know, we have retail customers. Those of us who are old enough will remember in the past, we used to go to the bank and we will bring our passbook to withdraw money from the bank. And then ATMs appeared and then we would be withdrawing the money from the ATM. So you don't need to go to the bank branch anymore. And then now you can bank on your phone anytime, anywhere. So what the bank has done is it has helped retail customers at scale, right? I mean, it's able to help customers, even though they are, they are retail customers to help them uh, by developing platforms and to, to serve them, support them uh, at scale. And then they are the high net worth customers, right? These are the ones where the bank keeps calling you to tell you, hey, you know, what's your financial plan? What, is, what are you going to buy next? What are the things that you're going to do next in the next two to three years? We have all these products. Can we help you? And actually, these are the good companies, the strong local companies, the, the growing companies, companies like Hope Technique that we want to work with closely in partnership with them, uh, understanding what their plans are for, for the next few years. Look at the range of things that we can help them uh, uh, with, whether it's uh, uh, financial support, which is the basic form of support, right? We have grants, we have loans, we take equity but also capability building. And I can talk a bit about that later, but capability building in terms of helping companies digitalize, helping companies internationalize, and supporting them to innovate and compete in the world. And Enterprise Singapore was set up precisely to do that. We have capabilities uh, on all these various fronts, for instance, on internationalization. We have 36 offices in 21 countries all over the world to help companies reach out and uh, build markets there. So there are many things that we can do and we're determined to help the best local companies in Singapore grow, to internationalize, go beyond our, our borders. And as uh, Peter said, right, to really launch ourselves, accelerate from us out of a standstill. We want to be ready because at the turn of the year, we think that the world is going to be ready to open up, Omicron notwithstanding, and we want to be the first out of the gate. I just wanted to bring up a point. Thank you so much, Mr. Xiao. I think this is going to be very interesting because what you just said, it's like Singapore has been doing phenomenally well for supporting people. At the same time, somehow for the business owners, there is some level of a, a barrier for the real down ground level business leaders or SMEs to receive this. I'll tell you an example that happened literally during COVID. So, you know, our organization, Go Global, we started to really go out there and support a lot of SMEs uh, for overseas companies to come into Singapore. But when we couldn't go out of Singapore in March 20, when I came back and all of this thing happened, in April, I was down the road in one of our favorite streets in Singapore. 
and we saw the whole street shut down, I was speaking to one of the organization leaders. And I told him, he said, let's quickly support these SMEs, get them online, which I have already been talking to these organizations way before in 2016 and 17. And uh, the response I got from this leader, and I don't want to even go into the details of it, is don't worry, everything will be okay by July and the government will take care of it by then. This is the response from a very responsible leader of years and it comes from an association. So there is somebody there that kind of, and, and of course you know, by then, whatever that has happened since then till now, literally closed down of many shops and, and a literally makeover of the whole street is right now the state. So what am I saying is, can we create an environment in Singapore where the associations or chambers are not being a, kind of like a gatekeeper, rather the collaborating partner for the small medium enterprises that are not just, you said the word best, I would like to be very subjective about the word best. Well, how does, what does best really mean? And we're talking about trailblazers who may not be the best, but the ones that can really go out there and make the change, uh, you know, innovation in innovating and going abroad. So can we uh, re-look at the way these companies are assessed and what other ways can the government support by, you know, looking at beyond just going through chambers and associations? Maybe... Is there any anybody else who'd like to give some thoughts on that? Oh, perhaps we can have uh, Jeffrey uh, give a quick response to your your point. Sure. I mean, just a quick response. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I agree with uh, uh, Ziza uh, on her views. I mean, the, the TACs and the associations and the the uh, uh, well, the trade associations, they are really our partners. They are here to help both. Uh, be an intermediary between the companies and SMEs and in, uh, uh, with the government. Sometimes they help us reach out. Sometimes they help directly with uh, uh, the companies that need the help. Um, Sean, uh, he's uh, uh, involved uh, in the Singapore Indian Restaurants Association. So he, play, he plays a very critical role for us because it is not always easy for government to reach out directly to the partners straight away. Yeah, and of course, I mean, occasionally you do get, um, you know, associations that that may react in the way that you you have uh, uh, outlined. You know, looking out for the government to to step out first. Uh, in in many cases in Singapore, a lot of issues are like this. The government takes the lead, but in in truth, is it works best if we are in partnership with the companies. I think that's how it works. Good. I'm, I'm so appreciative of the answer and the word is keep coming up and this is what we are talking. So there is a leadership space that needs to be enhanced at different levels. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm glad you said that, Jeff. Uh, it, it is important, I think, for people to feel that the government is there, but it shouldn't be anything more than a, than a safety net. Mm. You know, it shouldn't be a safety harness personal to you, I think we all need to. And, and my question here is, you know, just let's, let's just take the few of us here, right? There are, including myself, there are five entrepreneurs here amongst us. Why do we need to look at Jeffrey or ESG all the time for us to collaborate? I'm just putting a challenge. What is stopping us from calling each other? What is stopping Loretta, for example, from having a conversation after this with Sean, now that you're acquainted, to say, Sean, I'm going to, if, if I want to, if I'm going to have a big, big show, uh, how can you support me? Similarly, Sean can talk to Loretta and say, I'm thinking of, of having, having some kind of food event can you help me to organize that event and make it really bring some big stars with your experience in, in international? Can you help to do something local? Le you know, sh using your expertise. It doesn't mean that because you succeeded, Loretta, in doing international shows, you can't do any mega local shows. You can. She does. See, what I'm trying to say is it all needs to, to start to be ignited with a conversation. But if everything has to start with the government 
initiating, government coming up with a program, then I don't think we can call ourselves entrepreneurs. Yes. I think then we are nothing more than just businesses. There's a difference between a business, a business and an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur constantly looks at ways to innovate and ways to survive, more than survive, ways to excite ourselves. You know, there's nothing stopping an engineer to develop something that requires engineering, uh, developing gadgets that will help us, you know, in our own businesses. So what I'm trying to say is, are we doing enough amongst ourselves, leveraging on online services and the internet to connect with each other? I, I suspect we're not doing enough. This is usually what happens when you have a very good government that's very generous. As they say, nothing grows un under a banyan tree. It's so large that light doesn't travel through. You have no undergrowth. I think, Loretta, you should speak about Clubhouse and how yeah. you went out of the way to... Yes, go ahead. No, Loretta. no. Well, this way, I, want, I want to say uh, something. I've, I've really gone out of my comfort zone uh, this past two years. Um, basically, as a female entrepreneur, you normally don't have anyone to seek help or ask. I mean, my own experience uh, being a female business owner, um, I kind of, you know, COVID helped me change my mindset. So previously, I was always fearful of asking for help. Why didn't I ask for help? Because, you know, I don't want people to say, oh, she's a business owner. How come she doesn't know this? So we're kind of supposed to know everything. So that's the mindset I had pre-COVID. So recently, and, and I want to come back to this really um, a simple observation I made. And the observation I, I'm making is uh, with Airbnb. So Airbnb, um, as we all know, is a marketplace where you know people rent their houses or their rooms out. Who would have thought that idea would you know, globalize, who would thought that idea, you know, could IPO and this become a billion dollar empire. So just two weeks ago, I, I had a crazy idea. In fact, I had the crazy idea, you know, last year. And I said, since we can't travel, we can't, you know, um, see shows and I can't find talent because my, my business is all about finding talent. I had a crazy idea, but I'm not going to share the crazy idea here. Why not? Um, um, I don't want to do <laughs> I think there is, a, there is a clubhouse room that somebody's phone is uh, making a lot of noise. Somebody's clubhouse, yeah. Go ahead, Loretta, I think go ahead. Yeah, so um, um, I've been really, you know, this sort of getting out of my comfort zone, trying to figure out new ways of reinventing, re-evolving the business. Uh, it's not easy. I've been reaching out to a lot of people in the, not in my space, uh, people in the media industry, in the tech industry. That's that's not my, um, my space at all. Um, it's not really a space I'm comfortable. So, and, and when I say this, that means um, I do need help. I do need to bring in um, skilled people to help me uh, scale the vision I have. But I see. I have a very big vision, but it's about the execution now. Yes. Um, just like Jeff Bezos, he was very lucky. He had a, a, a second hand, a, a, his right hand man. He 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 had the vision, but he had a, a second person to you know um, manage it and execute it for him. Uh, and so these these um, these you know these people you know. I, I look up to them, you know, and how they manage to, you know, scale their business. And um, I have big dreams and I, I do want to, you know, take the business to a global level. I have the vision. So now I do, I do need the the resources uh, and, the, and the minds to take the, the vision to the next level. See, so Lord, I uh, yeah. you, have, you have brought up something that I think many... Uh, I've met many Singaporeans who are in a similar situation. You know, there is ideation. You have that idea. You have, some, some of us are very good with ideas. But it doesn't mean that you are the best 
person to execute the idea. That, that's the point you're making, right? Now, I believe that that ESG has uh, has certain schemes where you can actually they actually match you with consultants, people who who are very good in that particular area, and they might be able to connect you and help you. See, what you need is someone with a slightly different exposure to sit with you and and say, this is how perhaps we can execute your idea. You know. Jeff, would you want to come in on that? I mean, I'm sure ESG might be able to help. Oh, absolutely. Like absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we we have helped companies in a variety of ways. I mentioned earlier that yeah. we do financial help. That's simple. I mean, that's just either grants or loans or even taking equity in the, in the company for those that we want to push a little bit harder. But actually, much more beyond this, we do capability support. Yeah. Um, as Vishwa said, we can connect you to business networks, sometimes to your peers, maybe to bigger companies or companies that have been trailblazers. I think Peter can probably speak to that a little bit because he's been helping us tremendously in bringing up other uh, smaller SMEs and also mentoring people who are in the same industry to, to grow. On top of that, we help companies internationalize. I mentioned we had 36 offices in 21 countries. And they are in countries as far away as uh, in Saudi Arabia, in South Africa, uh, even in Ghana. And there have been SMEs that have taken advantage and of, of the fact that we have business developers um, in these countries to say, OK, you know, can you help us link up with uh, similar businesses or markets in these sectors and help us see whether we can expand a new front step? And uh, of course, we also link up with uh, uh, existing innovation networks and venture capitalists and fun funding, financing and knowledge, basically. Uh, we have uh, uh, subsidiaries, for instance, uh, on innovation, where we link up uh, SME and SME founders with uh, people who have actually run successful businesses before, have done now, you know, they are retired, they are... Uh, not running business anymore, but they want to give back to the community. And so they help them mentor uh, uh, these startup companies to grow and look at how they can do their businesses uh, differently and better. So there are many, many things. I think what we are happy to do, I mean, in not just Loretta's case, but really with uh, many other uh, companies, uh, what we would like to, of course, do is to help them actually build capability. That's more sustained. It's not just about giving money. Giving money is easy. But the, the more difficult thing is building new capabilities to transform, to, to prepare ourselves for, for the period that will immediately follow COVID-19 so that we are, we are able to emerge stronger and companies are able to, to attack the, the, the new economy uh, with a, a better set of skills and capabilities. Jeff, a quick, a quick follow-up question. Thank you very much for what you said. Two quick questions. One is, how would how would someone make the first approach to ESG? I mean, is, is there something? Can we do it online? Can we set up a meeting? You know, that's number one. Secondly, uh, as you externalize, as you explore externalizing your enterprise, what sort of funding support can we expect? Because it, there, there are expenses involved when you want to try and market or, or build your, your business uh, overseas. Just a quick sense of it. I was going to offer my email address. No, I was kidding. Um, well, go ahead, do it. <laughs> I will do that. Yeah, but uh, actually, what happens is, is that it, Enterprise Singapore is structured along um, uh, several industry clusters. So within our say lifestyle and consumer clusters, we are very much aware of uh, what LMC is, what sort of company it is, how well it's been doing. I mean, we've been tracking it for a long time. In fact, we have officers who have engaged, I think, with uh, some of Loretta's staff before um, on various ideas that they may have had. Uh, sometimes they went through, I mean, we were able to engage on some 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 follow ups. Sometimes it, it, it doesn't happen because, you know, for various reasons. But we're happy to take that conversation further. What usually happens is the email is dropped to to our industry teams and then we just follow up and, and see what else we can do to help them. We get many of these queries every day. So, so it's not an not, not, uh, unknown process. Um, sometimes we can take that further as uh, 
you know, companies have specific, say, transformation plans or specific business plans. Sometimes they may need a certain catalyst, right? Um, whether it is uh, through uh, our our existing business grant schemes, like for example, the productivity solutions grant. Uh, if you have something that uh, a software or a, a you know digitalization product you need that's already in in our our approved list of uh, uh, support, then it's very easy. You get the you get the financial support very quickly. But if it's a bit more complicated than that, you need a customized solution. You need something, for example, maybe a specific machine equipment that requires it to be built and it's not sort of a ready-made. Then we can go into discussions. You put in a proposal under the Enterprise Development Grant and ESG can, can support you through that, through that too. Right now, I think we support uh, about 70% of uh, uh, most proposals that come in that, that we think are, 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 will help the company grow or to, to develop a new capability. And many companies have taken advantage of that. Last year, I think 22,000 companies were, were, awarded, were awarded the grant. And of course, if you were com a company that we know very, very well, that you have been very successful, like, like Peter, for example, she's, Hope Technique is one of our, what we call account managed companies. So we were very, very closely linked with them. We have an account manager that's dedicated to him, you know, whenever there's a, an issue, he will raise it to us. We we'll try our best to solve problems for them. This is a myriad. There's a myriad number of problems that could potentially come up. Uh, whether it's a, a understanding an overseas market, helping to open up an overseas market, whether it's to unlock some of the regulatory or export regulation issues that we may encounter from time to time, we help them. Uh, it is a, a that's a much more sort of involved exercise that we do only with a, a select group of companies. Um, but but we do that too. Thank you, thank you, uh, Peter. Just from you, in the engineering cluster, right? I mean, yours is hardcore engineering. Uh, what sort of challenges did you face your industry? Like like for example, F and B. A big challenge always is is workers, is manpower, mm. right? I mean, mm. it, it's a very different type of challenge. Um, mm. And and of course, because of COVID, it's about it's about uh, proximity issues and so on. So you can't have people filling up your restaurant. But in your case, in engineering, what are what are the unique challenges that you face? Um, so one of our business lines builds uh, emergency vehicles. So we do things like the Red Rhino fire trucks. Um, we actually um, deliver emergency vehicles to um, five other countries outside of Singapore. So in South Korea. Uh, Macau and all. That's the context. Um, now, to build these vehicles and design these vehicles, um, it's a unique talent that we require. Now, yeah. if I were to swing it the other way, and I hope that no one from the Land Transport Authority is listening to this, um, we like to turn our cars. You know, we are the bad boys. You know, the 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 the, the pocket rocket, the abing. You know, um, with the loud exhaust pipe. That's how we all started. Okay. Um, and if you want to know how big the challenge is, it's I guess. Um, that's the beauty of Singapore, but at the same time, I guess this is where the challenge comes from, um, where it is not allowed in Singapore. Um, so I just admitted it, right? Um, well, it's not allowed in Singapore. The, pro the challenge is that in other parts of the world, you know, um, if you're in London, you could have a four-post uh, bed with an engine below and four wheels, and you could actually road register it. Uh, and, and yeah. run around London. I've actually seen it. I'm sure a lot of you have seen crazy stuff around the world. <laughs> when I worked in the UK building race cars in a previous uh, life, um, one of my teammates in the office um, in Blackpool, he actually had a World War II uh, tank with a license plate. And we once drove it to the sandwich shop to buy sandwiches. <laughs> so you've got to wait for the punchline now, right? So what, what's that all about? I guess the biggest challenge that we face in the engineering world is um, if you talk to an American, they grew up in a two-car garage with a, a drill press and they know how to weld. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're in Israel, you know, uh, entrepreneurship is, um, is, is something that's somehow in their blood. Um, and I guess when it comes back to us for uh, engineering talent here, um, we are actually starting, I'm sorry to say, uh, on the back foot. Um, we don't have this kind of opportunities. Um, it, may, it could be land, it could be legislative, it could be many things. But this is part of the DNA that made Singapore successful. Let's not get that wrong. But at the same time, as the world is becoming, I guess, um, 10 years ago, 
innovation was not a very popular word. Uh, creativity was was not really celebrated. Um, now that the world sees that the Jeff Bezos of the world and the Elon Musk uh, engineers, I'm so happy for that. At last, engineers are cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is the challenge. We are starting. Um, we, our talent pool doesn't have that completeness. Academically, they are superior. They are really, really good. Um, but the hands-on knowledge is is a big gap, and that's what we face. So, so for for an industry such as yours. I mean, number one, it's very clear that the enrollment in engineering faculty in the universities and so on has been dropping, maybe stabilized. Secondly, many of those who, who graduate as engineers don't remain in engineering. They go on to do MBA and go into finance. This is this is the new reality. It's a new normal. And so, so we don't, we actually have a deficit of engineers in Singapore. And, and this is an area where if you, if you, want to survive i mean every country needs engineers right hardcore engine not not just it engineers but hardcore mechanical civil structural engineers and and we, we may not have a choice but to continue to look to the to the globe to bring in these engineers but lately there has been some form of xenophobia in singapore lately there has been a lot of resistance about bringing bringing high level professionals into singapore right now how do we how do you think we can cope with this because companies like yours after some time you you have to operate out of singapore you know uh, uh, once covid is done you may have to operate out of singapore where you have free flow of of engineering talent because without the ta kind of talent not just academic grades right you're also looking mm. for engineers with that x factor mm. how do we cope with that you know on, uh, on the other end of the spectrum you have got fnb shanmugam's side they need workers you need professionals we need both we need people from both ends of the spectrum how do we cope with this what's the solution you know and and these are big big questions that that i think surface especially because of covid I jeff like any that. response to that yes go ahead please yeah so what what is here i'm hearing and i'm in, very excited that Actually, uh, Peter spoke about Israel and how it is in their blood, so it is okay for them to speak about it and what's happening in Asia and Singapore being the financial hub of the space. When uh, Loretta, when Jack Bezos speaks about all these uh, IPOs and Airbnb and all of that, it feels okay. But uh, Loretta Alabos, if she's going to speak anything on that line, it's like, oh, that's too much. You know, we have been speaking with a lot of investment uh, portfolio people like when we tell them okay a company is worth 10 million or whatever the amount they feel like wow how can your company be worth so much so these kind of understand if it was an israeli background or somebody from us they see it differently but if it's from asia or from singapore they have a different take to it and this is a very very real a situation and especially the around capital mechanism which is what you know go global is very much in the space of wanting to bring in the leadership for conscious leadership for this uh, whole capital market where there's a revamp that's needed and i would really really ask of um, the esg to look at how this whole mindset and also the heart set around capital market and to uplift the asians with their clarity with you know with all these big companies coming in these big hearts like missions coming in where they say i want to be a billion dollar business i want to have a 10 billion dollar valuation how do we work with them because i have connected with the local stock exchanges and there's a lot of limitation in asia where we are not allowing this to happen in that space so i have to say at this juncture you know go global business school has a very ambitious dream of, uh, we have a roadmap of creating a $500 million market cap as a training organization, as a platform. So that has been uh, looked at. I'm like, you know, wow, you think you can do that? You know, female founders, you know, somebody was asking in the chat box, you know, entrepreneur, women entrepreneurs. And then we have Loretta, who's had tens of millions of dollars of revenue, you know, uh, track record. And when she's claiming her company to be a $10 million worth, and it's like, how can you claim your company to be valued 10 million? So these are knowledges that has, you know, there's a gap there. And we would love to see uh, Asia space and especially from Singapore being the icon, create more billion dollar based Singapore entrepreneurs. I mean, it's not about the number, it's just about the stand and the leadership that we can take together 
and that requires so if I, a lot. So if I hear you correctly, Aziza, I think the point you're making is not so much whether the organization, the company has the capability, but it's actually about branding. I mean, a, a refusal to accept that this particular company, even though it is it is delivering, because it is a local company, there's an unwillingness to accord it the right status. Yes. Am I am I correct in assuming that that's what more you're saying? than saying accord it? It is not considered you know seriously regarded. Yeah, it's, it's not considered. Else, yeah. yeah, it's not considered. So so is this is this is this real? I mean, I'd like to ask the other the other panelists whether okay. yes, Loretta. Okay, I want, I want to bring something up. Um, earlier this year, there's a company in, in the US um, called Jam. So they are they are tokenizing and NFTing their comedy content. What, what is NFT? A non fungible token. So they take um, oh, okay. a non, non -fungible and token they well. put it on the blockchain and forever they, yeah. this content will will have a legacy when all the smart contracts are released. So there's a company in the US called Jam. And they were, they're not in the comedy space, but here I've been slogging with my own money. You know, the work I've done, uh, I did it on my own because if I waited for sponsors, I would, won't have that body of work to speak for myself. So what I've been doing has been rolling the money, you know, rolling the, the, the one show after another. So it's been very hectic. That's why I've been out of the, out of the scene, <laughs> you know, be, working behind the scenes. But here comes this company, um, you know, in the U.S., they, I don't know whether it's a, a manhood thing, but, you know, they raised $3.5 million, you know, just like that. I, mean, I know it's hard work. I, I won't say it's just like that, but I know it's very hard work to raise money. But here I am, I've done all this body of work, brought in the biggest comedians I could. I sometimes pinch myself from Trevor Noah to Margaret Cho to everyone. And here, you know, I'm having difficulty in proving myself as a female founder and it's very heartbreaking i have to say that you know i have to, i have you, still had to prove you, myself you are bringing up a new dimension i mean another dimension apart mm. from the brand singapore being not being appreciated or sufficiently valued that's what i'm hearing you're also talking about uh, both you and aziza are highlighting women entrepreneurs i mean the fact that you are of a particular gender it is working against you uh, am I correct in saying that? Yes. That's what you're suggesting. And it's we're, harder. We're, yeah. yeah. And, we're, you know, yeah. Di and we're diverse as well. <laughs> and not yeah. About, yeah. Okay, this is like going a different direction. Like, yeah. It's not about that, whether women entrepreneurs or not. But that is in, globally, just for everybody's record, in, even in US, only 3% of female founders are invested. This is a, a track record mm. of how women okay. get it funded. There's so many reasons for it. I am more uh, interested in looking at the real talent, regardless of gender, when there's real value, how much can the sure. Asia and Singapore look at, uh, you know, at a new level of growing, especially like what Mr. Shanmugam mentioned. He said about uh, creating new business, the customer base. Actually, we have to go to the next level, creating new business models with the same customer. For example, if Mr. Shanmugam is going to cater to audiences and he already have corporate clients in his portfolio, he can create a new partnership with Loretta, offering her lunchtime laugh programs through her her. This is a collaboration thing that we talked about. New yeah, business yeah. models innovated mm -hmm. out of it, where collaboration comes into place and the community grows stronger. This is really, I would say, uh, in a very uh, layman term, this is a Singapore model, the left pocket to right pocket. We haven't yeah. got to a community of left pocket to right pocket yeah. where we are growing and thriving internally so we can overflow to external bodies. So yeah. that is where the See, creativity but, but I, needs I, to come in. Yeah, may, may I suggest that, that we, we, we go back to the earlier point uh before going to the collaboration point i think the earlier point is that singapore companies are not being sufficiently being accorded sufficient value time appreciation uh is this true and if it is true uh what accounts for this and what can be done jeff well it's not true definitely from enterprise singapore's context i mean for us, I'm here, we are all here. Our mission is to go to local enterprises and to support you in whatever way it is. That was the reason why, Vishwa, as you mentioned, why ESG was formed, right? Three and a half years ago, 
we had Spring, which was looking after SMEs, and then we had IE Singapore, which was looking after group internationalizing companies. We decided to put it together and said, okay, you know, we wanted to grow Singapore companies into global champions. And so we set up this organization. We are now 1,200 strong, a large organization. And we are involved in, in, in a variety of work to build the capabilities that will enable our companies to grow and to do well in the world. So if you're looking at what, what is a government priority, I would say, you know, we, we have definitely been very focused on trying to help Singapore companies punch above their weight in the world. I think Loretta's example was, uh, I, I, I don't know the details, but I, I think the funding, I think what she meant is that the private sector, the private sector funding, for some reason, yes. didn't value her company as much as she she felt it was worth. And I think that that that's worth looking at. I mean, why is it that, that the private sector does that? Is it because she's a woman entrepreneur? Is it because they didn't understand the business? Uh, we, I, I, I don't know. I think there could be a variety of reasons for that. Some of it is fair, some of it is not. Um, I wanted to go back to, to make sure of three, three other points, which was, if you don't mind, yeah. one is on sure, this issue please. of manpower, right? You had talked yeah. about manpower and the difficulty of doing that. I, I, I share, I think Peter's uh, optimism that it's a good thing that, that things are changing, you know. Five to ten years ago, if you tell your parents that I'm going to become an entrepreneur, or go into tech and do a startup, they would like, you know, kick you out of the house. Yep. Now, you know, yeah, they happily, you know, please go ahead, you know, go along. And that's a good thing. But even if we have all our Singaporeans do this, the, the, the fact of the matter is the numbers are not enough. We are a small country. We will not have the, the quality, the numbers of talent that China or India or all these other big countries will have. And so to compete against the world, we have no choice but to be able to bring talent in. And that was what you said, right? You know, we have to, to bring talent from all over the world to come in and help us grow our company yeah. to do well. But unfortunately, I mean, it's not just in Singapore, but the protectionist, protectionist nativist instincts have risen all over the world. Before COVID, you remember there was the yellow jacket so yeah. in, in France, anti-immigration sentiments in Germany, and then the US, Trump was, was, was elected. We have to deal with it. I mean, it's something that, that happens to us too. I mean, people feel insecure about what where globalization is taking, taking them, how their lives are being affected. And we have to make adjustments to reassure people that they will be taken care of. This is why I think the government is, is looking at our foreign worker policies and say, okay, what do we need to adjust so that so that we are better able to write, find the right balance between bringing in the talent we need, yet at the same time creating enough opportunities for Singaporeans to be able to, to make a good living and compete in the world. And of course, more importantly, to, to retain political support for the whole system for the yep. whole sort of uh, slate of policies that we have to retain support for this balance. Um, and I think we're, we're making those adjustments and I think we will get there. Finally, the small point about women entrepreneurs. I want to encourage, I'm very glad that our panel is here amongst, amongst you know, as we have uh, three out of the seven who are women entrepreneurs. Um, I, I want to tell a little story. You know, in my previous job, uh, uh, when I was, uh, Principal Private Secretary to, to the Prime Minister. I arranged for him to meet a group of uh, women entrepreneurs. There were quite a few of them. Um, for example, some of you will, you will be familiar with Rachel from Love Bonito, Felicia Gan from Gimli, Yvonne Bock from Hagen, Jessica Chang from Eco Business. All very successful and they came together. They had a good conversation with, with the PM. And after that, PM uh, shared with me, he said, oh, you know, this, uh, 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 tea session was a di bit different from usually when he meets companies. You know, when one of the entrepreneurs brings up a problem, all the other women entrepreneurs chipped in to volunteer solutions and ideas and uh, how to collaborate, you know, to, to get together to say, let's solve the problem together. Is it very different from when he, he meets the usual, you know, businessman and the, maybe the men? Yeah, so maybe there's hope, you know, actually, I think if you go and go into those those stories of the women entrepreneurs they're very inspiring they were up against the odds uh, it, it, you know maybe they, they met some of the problems that i think precisely loretta had, had faced but because they were truly at their essence whether they were ma male or female they were entrepreneurs first they found solutions they worked together with people they collaborated and they got out of it and, and they are fabulously successful so that, that that I thought that was a story worth sharing, you know, to inspire yeah, the people. And, and that's that's yeah. really wonderful and wonderful to hear. Yeah. 
Um, and and I, I don't see why it has to be anything else. Um, I, I think we're very fortunate in many ways to be here in Singapore because compared to many other many other societies, I think women women are being given a lot more equal treatment. You know, there's there's a lot more a lot more we can do in that space. But I think we are we are in a in a fairly good space. But may, may I suggest this? You know, uh, we we have actually overrun. We are we are five thirty six now. Uh, if I could ask the the other panelists, the entrepreneurs. Uh, to take just one one minute, no more than one minute, make one point that you would like us all to leave with. One point that is very important for you. I'd like to start with Candice. Um, okay. I'd like to present it on both sides. One is, I'm still very concerned about companies right having to um, companies being able to uh, be with their internal teams to help them navigate through all these and uh, not only embrace the new norm but master the new norm so that that's a whole lot of work to be done so that's one part i'm passionate about the other one is that i see new hope and light um, as i said i want to be in we need to be in creation mode. So now having been in this panel, I know that we have a new hope to work with, uh, for me, with Go Global School, to work with ESG, all right, to see if we can build something, why not, for the whole community of trainers. Yeah, thank you. In partnership. And, and just, yeah, in partnership, and just to interject, you know, perhaps ESG may also want to consider, you know, paying attention to the the internal stresses of organizations that Candice has been referring to. You know, small or large companies, you know, there, there are a lot of internal stresses that SMEs may not be sufficiently equipped mm. uh, to deal with. Perhaps you want to pay attention to that because it can result in implosions that we can actually avoid. So uh, instead of just looking at businesses in the in the in the conventional sense of the word, we may we may want to look a little bit more about helping with the internal dynamics like HR, uh, talent, working mothers situations, and so on. You know, just a quick interjection. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. P thank you, Peter. Um, it's it's the same point again. Uh, the 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 green lights are on. Uh, hopefully it's for real. We don't we don't lock down again. Uh, run. Everyone really has to do it. But I think we should be cognizant of um, the fellow countrymen. Uh, I am not drawing a line regionally or by country, but let's be honest. Our neighbor is our friend, and everyone needs uh, food on their table. I think you mentioned just now, Viswa, very accurately. It's a question of collaboration. Maybe if there's a public a, a call out, it's help each other. Um, it's everyone is battered and bashed up in different ways um yes. it's not going to be easy the whole world is desperate um if we can help the person on our right and all and all and on our left then i think we should now more so than ever before so wishing everyone well thank you wonderful thank you um shanmugam what's the wisdom well um uh, let's not worry about the pandemic just go for it, move forward, uh, go digital. Uh, we were talking about uh, automation, now we're going digital and uh, just let's move forward and do not worry about, uh, about the pandemic and all that. And there shouldn't be any reason for us to worry about. And for the restaurateurs, I would like to remind them, food is always a necessity and nobody is going to fast or nobody is going to go hunger. So. You need food, so instead of they coming, you move forward and deliver them. Thank you. Good, thank you. Loretta. Uh, well, this way I'm just uh, taking in and enjoying all the comments that the entrepreneurs here are providing. I have nothing to say at this moment, but I've enjoyed this session thoroughly, so thank you. Um, you. you know, Dr. Aziza, thank you, Viswa. You're such a amazing moderator. Yeah. Just love thank hearing you. your voice. Yeah, love it. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Loretta. Thank you. And um, just my my two cents worth, right? It's just a simple point. Whether it is COVID, whether it is uh, frozen quota on foreign workers, you know, whatever it is, an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is defined by a mindset. You, the moment you step into the arena as an entrepreneur, you must be prepared to fall. But the, the art is to get up, dust your feet, dust your knees and move on. In that sense, COVID is just another, another, another season where you fall. You get up, you learn, you move. And I truly believe that COVID will and has thrown up the best and the worst in our entrepreneurs. And in the end, it's the Darwinian principle of survival that actually will reign. Some of us perhaps are not meant to be entrepreneurs. If all we are looking for are handouts, we are not meant to be entrepreneurs. Some of us who are meant to be entrepreneurs will actually soar. We will develop wings and we will soar. And that's my true belief, you know, as long as we don't go into handout mentality. Yeah. And um, before I hand over to Aziza, final word from you, Jeff. Thank you, Vishwas. I, I thought it was a good way for, for us to end, actually. <laughs> but I just wanted to just make one quick point. I mean, you know, Singapore is a small, successful country. We, you know, if anything, we are an entrepreneurial country. We did things our own way, just as how you all are doing things now as, as entrepreneurs. I think we must continue to grow our own timber, continue to grow our own talent. And that's why uh, when we talk about Enterprise Singapore's mission, which is to grow Singapore companies and to internationalize them. That was a mission that was very meaningful to me. That's the main reason why I decided to come and join Enterprise Singapore three months ago. So whatever it is, I mean, it, for all the, the entrepreneurs out there, just I just wanted to send a note of encouragement. Enterprise Singapore will support you. We are there for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Aziza. Oh my God, this is so amazing. I'm so, so inspired by every single one of you. I just have to say this. When we started the journey of whatever that we've put together right now for SMEs to grow, one thing we spoke about is to be pandemic proof. Have you heard of this word underlined pandemic proof? It's not just your business, but as a business leader, how much can you be pandemic proof? I think Mr. Viswa touched on that. You know, whatever happens, how are we in our mind and also our heart, how, how much are we aligned to Womanda Sheng Yi, which is our business, our way of life? You know, we say Sheng Yi means Sheng is Sheng Huo, you know, our life, and Yi Shi. What kind of meaning do we give to our business and how much are we committed to running our business as a way of life and becoming pandemic proof to rise above all situations? And I just wanted to highlight the five intelligence which everybody can take back and look at how we are looking at our business in regards to the five intelligence framework that Go Global has created or formed as a, as a support. One is your emotional intelligence or rather your wisdom. How much are we you know, taking everything that's happening around us personally or otherwise emotional intelligence? And then we have financial intelligence, which is about money consciousness. Forget about your PNL. That would have gone to ruts right now. And I think Peter spoke about it very well. It's starting from zero. But what is your money consciousness, your money relationship? Your financial intelligence, where is it right now? And then we have physical intelligence that the world has shown us, be it in Singapore or be it in your body, you know, wherever you are, you have to have a physical presence in, in a healthy body to survive any kind of situations. And then we come to spiritual intelligence, which is nothing to do with religion, but as a Singapore organization, you know, as Singaporeans, we talk about that unity in diversity. How much are we united as one? community one singapore in moving this forward and i just loved when mr viswa talks about collaboration how much are we looking at each other and saying let's do this together and why where can we innovate as a community and the final and the most important one which i know everybody i want to use this word i'm sorry but we have learned from it is failed is 
environmental intelligence. I'm not talking about the going green, but how much are we vigilant of what's happening in our industry? How much are we able to step up and catch it and not fall flat? We can definitely rise above everything when we are environmentally intelligent and i somehow feel as singaporeans we have a bit complacent and i'm using a bit very modestly if i were to say otherwise we are too complacent as business leaders we want to really be a you know as government coming to support us and partner us how much can we rise above in our leadership to grasp that and really make use of that best opportunity to go global. In Go Global Business School, we are very excited. You know, we open doors for many organizations like Clubhouse, as we see it. Actually, uh, Mr. Jeffrey, you want to just click on some of the bios in the Clubhouse room. We have representatives from Maldives, uh, one of the political, I mean, from the government area. He's there from tourism. We have people from UK. We have people from Australia from uh, US, from uh, Canada, from Italy, and many other countries uh, have showed up in the room. Of course, India. By the way, Go Global has an office in India. We have planned to you know, go into a stock exchange listing in um, India as well. So we have built a global community, even though we were already global. Clubhouse has opened doors for us to really interact and create an environment. And Inspirethon, actually, when we created this, was to demonstrate that globalization is possible right from in our home and as a global community we can support each other and we want a business leaders to step up and hear that that possibility through that business model innovation through their clarity in their business direction and most importantly you know whatever way we want to get funds like what mr jeffrey said money is easy to get is the capabilities and the clarity how you're going to use it that makes all the difference for us to grow a business. So we are very committed to national development, regional growth, and global prosperity. And I'm very confident Singapore is capable of delivering that for every entrepreneur that shows up in our space. So thank you so much to each and every one. Thank you, Mr. Jeffrey, for your time, Mr. Shanmugam, Mr. Peter, and our the dear, dear team members. You know, we're very glad to be you know working with Loretta on LAMC to see how her growth can be acceler accelerated. And of course, my chief transformation officer, Candice, as well. And most importantly, Mr. Wiswa. Mr. Wiswa, thank you so much for holding the space. You know, this is something that I would not be able to have delivered alone. Your guidance in, uh, you know, uh, IQI and all the amazing work that you do to bring out the voice of uh, business leaders and local issues. We really thank you for your presence with us. I and my business partner, Mr. Ayipadas, who's also in the room with me, we are really, really grateful for the space that's provided and also your collaboration. We're really looking forward to a one-to-one -one session with you on January 11th. That's going to happen on on Zoom, not here. It's going to happen yeah. on Zoom where many others will be available to us. So thank you once again for thank all you. this uh, people that are speaking here, as well as the listeners who have tuned in. If you're listening into this, I want you to leave a message in the LinkedIn, as well as in Clubhouse. Drop us a message on the back channel. What are your views? What are the questions you want to have answered? We will take time to go into the uh, chat box and get your answer to you, especially if you're a Singapore business owner or wanting to set up your business in Singapore. We welcome you <laughs> and wanting to look at next level of growth together. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, have so a wonderful weekend and Merry Christmas. Yes, Merry Christmas, Goodbye. everybody, and Happy New Year. We'll Goodbye. see you soon. Thank you. Merry Christmas, Bye. everybody. Thank Bye. You. Thanks for Bye. the New Year. Bye-bye.